I think, I'm, yeah, I think I'm recording, yes. Yep. Okay, all right, so uh, this is the primary interview process, um, and the purpose of this interview is to discuss the state of each subsystem and address any concerns with the model-based design timeline. Um, today we're doing the microcontroller team with Oscar, who's the team leader, Oscar. All right, thank you, Jake. Yeah, my name is Oscar Acosta. I'm in the controller, microcontroller team leader. Uh, we are basically a group of six people um, from different backgrounds, mainly electrical and computer science, but also we have um, mechanical engineers in the, in the, in the group. Um, so far, uh, we consider ourselves the heart of the, of the, of the project, but with the with in both in both sense because we are the center of the of the project, but because we also have the softest part of it, we are not the ones who deal with physics. We are not the ones who deal with uh, um, deep uh, simulations. So I think we have the good of being the center, but the also the good of not having to have to deal with a lot of uh, high end uh, yeah physics and, and, and engineering. So let me show you where we are, what we have so far. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my, my presentation with you. Do you see it? Yeah, I do, go ahead. I'm putting it, do you see it? You still see it, right? Yep, yeah, you're okay, good. Perfect. So basically, um, as far as we have uh, uh, organized our work, uh, we have, we have Four customers, uh, which are the other four subsystems in the project. Um, those four customers basically will give us uh, their demands. So they have to tell us what they need from us, and and with that in hand, we make software and hardware accommodations to serve them. Basically, that's the way we see ourselves as the as the main provider for the whole for the whole project. Um, in that sense, uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, uh, input and output um, interaction with those subsystems, and, um, and in different in different capacities. Uh, which the biggest one for all our concerns is basically the ADCS. Is the one going to require the most uh, amount of hardware and also the most amount of um, computing power? So this is basically a summary a summary of where we are. Um, I'm going to start with the ADS, ADCS subsystem. As we have it right now, the ADCS subsystem has basically six components. Uh, the, oh, out of those six components, uh, four basically are um, input generators. But what I'm talking about input is from our perspective, from the microprocessor perspective, and output is also from, my, from the microprocessor perspective. The, um, those uh, four uh, main components that are going to provide us information are the magnum, magnetometer, which is uh, this one here. Basically, we're going to have one line of communication that is going to come into us. It's digital. And we're going to provide, basically, with four lines of control and, and, uh, and also commands. The magnetometer requires some commands to activate some processes, and uh, we are in the process of actually identifying those commands and those protocols in order to, to accommodate that. The other main part of the of the input um, of the information acquiring uh, section of the ADCS is the internal measurement unit or or IMU. Um, the, I'm sorry, inertia. These Unit basically measure acceleration and uh, and uh, linear acceleration and angular acceleration, right? So it will give us basically uh, six main input lines, which are for uh, two for each axis. One is going to give us the rotation rate, and the other one is going to give us acceleration rate in that in in that axis. Um, with these two elements, basically these two elements together are going to give us the, the, the bulk of the information for us to know how the, the unit is basically rotating, in what direction, 
and at what speed. Those are the main, the main sources of information for our subsystem. The other important source of information, or the other two important, are these ones, which basically the sun sensor and the GPS, okay? The sun sensor basically give us a, in what angle the, the satellite is oriented related to the position of the sun. And that, that's important for us for two main reasons. The first one is to make sure that we are getting the most uh, energy out of it. And the second part is that we are protecting our experiment. So we always try to be uh, uh, facing, what I mean face, the face of, for me, the, for us, the face of the satellite is the experiment. That's the front of the satellite. So we are facing away from the sun as much as possible. And if we can't, we will need to define some mechanisms to protect the, the experiment. Um, and as I said, the other reason is basically to get, to get the most amount of power from the sun. The other source of information is the GPS. The GPS, as we all know, we just give us uh, where on the surface of the, earth, of the Earth we are and at what altitude. Well, the altitude will be known, so that won't change because at the orbital position of the satellite, the satellite will be in just one orbit. We don't change orbits. Uh, but anyways, that information will be given by the by the GPS. But the, actually, the main the main the main inform, the main uh, chunk of information that we will receive from the GPS is the position regarding the the, the surface of the Earth. For and and this is something that we are discussing. But the the main reason for knowing that is communications. We need to know uh, two things basically. When we are in range of our Earth station, and uh, which is a slash in range of any other Earth station that we might use. So that's something that we, we, we will need to know. GPS won't give us a lot of uh, trouble in terms of uh, controlling the orientation, I mean, in terms of the amount of uh, con computing power that we will need. Um, because we really don't need to make any controlling of the position of the satellite using the GPS. It would be more, more uh, uh, a source of, uh, as I said, information on where we are. The, with these four elements, and basically these, these two, the sun sensor, the, mag the magnetometer, and the internal inertia measurement uh, unit, we control the two main elements for our a attitude determination, which are the reaction wheels and the magnet torques, all right? The reaction wheels, as far as we uh, know right now, uh, is a whole and a, a all included system right now. What it means, what, what I mean by that is that it has the electronics that controls the actual spinning of the reaction wheels. So as far as we understand, we don't need to uh, do the, the, um, the actual uh, voltage control of the, of, the, of the motors for the wheels to, roll, to run, to rotate. The electronics is already in. So what we need to do is basically to tell the reaction wheel assembly how fast and in what direction the rotation must be. The way to do that is basically using a, using a pulse width a modulation, PWM, by giving a, within certain amount of time a certain amount of pulses. So let me just write something here. We will have a section of time, and with that section, we will define how many pulses are gonna be in it. And based on that many pulses, the electronics in the in the assembly will define how fast it has to run. All right. There is a, a, a question mark right now, and actually I've been I've been interacting with the manufacturer of the reaction wheel that I saw from our ADCS system uh, is on the direction uh, we are going to rotate positive or, or negatively, and the definition of that is there are two options for that. The first option is with the duty cycle. The other option is basically with a with a um, 
sorry, with a uh, oh, what is it? With um, a, um, a polarity de de determination. The duty cycle thing, uh, a definition is basically every pulse has an up and a down before the next pulse, the next pulse, uh, pulse starts. This distance is called the duty cycle. If the duty cycle is more than 50% of the length of the whole pulse, which is this, we say it's a positive movement. It's something that we can determine. If the duty cycle is less than 50%, we can say it's a negative uh, movement. So the, 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 the definition on, on using the duty cycle as a way to define if we, if we are going to rotate in one direction or the other, uh, that, it, that requires a lot more computing, but it has an, an enormous advantage is that it, it reduces by half the number of ports that we need to control the, the, the reaction wheel assembly. On the other hand, the other option is to have basically a pin that is going to be positive, I mean, a one or zero, if it is one, we're going to rotate positive. If it is zero, we're going to rotate negative. That's way easier to, to, to do the, the algorithms and controlling. The, the computer is, is, is a lot easier. Uh, but again, we'll need three more ports to do that. All right? That's, that's a big question mark at this time. Um, the final part of the, of the whole interaction with the ADCS in a, a subsystem is the magnet torque, which is this one. The magnet torque, uh, as I, as we have seen from the from our colleagues on the ADCS subsystem, uh, it's going to be a standalone uh, rods. I mean, uh, magnetic rods with no electronics in it. That is not a big deal, actually. Uh, for us, it doesn't uh, increment significantly the amount of computing that we have to do. Um, the only thing is that we need to define the the actual uh, amount of current that those those rods are going to receive, um, and the direction of that current. Let me put it in a little in a little graph here. The idea is that if they receive positive current, it's going to rotate in the positive direction. I'm going to it's going to torque in the positive direction. And if it is receive a negative current, it's going to torque in the negative direction, all right? However, our microprocessor only produces positive values of voltage when it's working um, analog, all right? So our outputs are from 0 to 3.3 .3 volts. That's all we have in our, uh, in our uh, microcontroller. However, we can accommodate a little this is a very schematic presentation, so you have to bear with me. It will be something like this. This is the this is the output from the microcontroller, okay? And this is actually gonna what's what's gonna go to the to the magnet torque. This assembly is gonna have an actual positive and negative sources of voltage. So I'm going to have like here minus five probably and plus five voltage. Okay. The idea is that I designed these resistors and probably a couple of diodes uh, with a whole assembly in a way that when the input here is let's say 1.5 volts, I get zero volts here. If I get 3.3 .3 volts, then I get five plus five and if I get here zero, I get here minus five. So this, this little configuration here, what it does is to change the input from positive only to the full range of positive and negative. That's not very complicated, but it's something that has to be designed and, and accommodated. Um, but other than that, at the end of the day, is the more voltage we put in it, the more torque the, the, the magnet torque is going to provide in that particular axis and in that particular direction. We have three axes, 
So we're going to have two magnet torques, and we're going to have three outputs from our microcontroller. All right. There okay. are a lot of a lot of question marks right now. Uh, hmm. The biggest one is the one for the reaction wheels. We need to know how we're going to control the, the positive and negative rotation of those wheels um, and, and how we're going to compute that. Uh, actually, I, I, after we discussed with, with the rest of the team, we, we, we saw that even though we're going to use three more ports, it's going to be easier for the process and faster for the process of a uh, of, of making the algorithms if we can use uh, a polarity pin instead of a duty cycle uh, a designation for the, for the rotation. Having said that, um, if the electronics inside the reaction wheel assembly is smart enough to do the, the duty cycle uh, accommodation, well, we'll do that, no, no problem in there. The other source of, 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 um, of um, questions, or the other question, big question mark we have now is with the GPS. With the GPS, we have a, a situation that we have, the GPS is gonna, is gonna give us a lot of bits, but we don't know what they mean. So we need to know if it's gonna send us 00111, that means I'm sending you altitude. Or if it's gonna it's gonna send whatever whatever sequence of, of binary code that's gonna send, we need to know what it means. We don't know that. I already asked the manufacturer. The manufacturer is giving me some information, but it's a little bit reluctant on giving me a manual because we are not buying anything yet. Um, so it seems, at least from this manufacturer, that if we're gonna get that kind of information, is because we're gonna buy the, the, the GPS from them. But that's something that we that's that has to be discussed with the ADC, ADCS subsystem a team and, um, and 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 be and be defined later. I guess uh, at this time is one of the questions that we have. Okay. So this is the main the main block diagram for the interaction between the the, the MSP430 the microprocessor and the ADC ADCS uh, subsystem. Questions here for this particular thing. Um, I have a few, but uh, I'll wait to the end. Up to the end, okay, perfect. The power control. The power control in the interaction is actually the simplest one. Uh, at this point, basically, what we think we need to do with the with the power subsystem is to be able to shut down power to different subsystems. Basically, that's that's it. Um, we just want to to be able to turn off the experiment or the communication subsystem or even the ADCS if we need to. Uh, as you might see here, I have a little different. Uh, this this switch is basically this SW is basically a switch. What it means, if I have a one here, no current here. If I have a zero here, then current goes. That's basically what it's gonna be. Uh, this is very simple to implement. The only thing is that, as you saw, the ADCS is not just one single component. It's six components. So that's why I put a, a thick line here. The discussion at this moment is, okay, do we want to shut down the whole ADCS or, ch or I mean, Turn, if, you, if you say, if we need to shut, uh, shut down ADCS, we shut it all, all off, or we want the ability to turn on off different sections of the ADCS. The, the advantage of having different sections is, well, that is flexibility. We, we define, if we, if we want or to only to turn off some parts of it for some reason, that's a good thing. Flexibility is always a good thing. Uh, the, cost of that is ports. We will, we will need one specific port for each switch that we want to implement. And obviously more, more, more computing power, but that part might be not a, be a, a big deal, um, but ports might be. So that's something that we have to discuss. As, as we have it right now, uh, if we turn off the ADCS, we will turn off 
the whole subsystem, all six components of it. But that might change. And actually, you will see at the end of the presentation, it seems that we have accommodated some spare ports. So that's a good thing. So we will have probably eight to nine extra ports we are not using right now. So that will give us some some wiggle uh, room to, to, uh, to define stuff like this. The only input that we will get from the power system is the total power production reference or level or something. What we mean by that is, I think it's important to know how much power actually the power subsystem is producing at one particular particular moment. Because actually with that amount of power, we need to compute if, if the power being produced is not enough and we are in a critical situation, we need to know who we're gonna give that little power that we're having or that we need to correct that situation somehow. That's a, that's a way to measure because power is everything in, 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 in space and in everywhere. So if we don't have power, we don't have anything. And if we have too little power, then we need to know how to correct it. In order to know, to, to know that, we define this input. This input really at this moment is, is as, we, as we perceive it, is an analog uh, input to the, to the microprocessor. And it will depend on how the power subsystem uh, is designing its, its own subsystem. Is that if the power subsystem can provide us with an actual with an actual reference that they can they can uh, uh, measure their own power production and give us a level of reference, that would be great. On the other hand, if they cannot do that, then we would need to put some extra circuitry in order to censor each output of the power subsystem add up all those outputs and get our own reference. Um, but anyways, in either case, it, from, the side of, from the point of view of the microprocessor, it's just, it is gonna be just one input. The question is what it goes here in the middle. This little circle that I'm making here, it could be just the line that is drawn or it could be as a, a more more sophisticated circuitry that, that we have to design ourselves in order to very basically sample all the outputs of the power subsystem or, or whatever they, they, are, they are they are producing the power. So that's that's a, that's one of the questions that we have there. Okay. Okay. And this is the the last. Uh, block diagram for the for the other two subsystems. Um, these are they are simple. Uh, they actually the 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 in terms of uh, power the um, in terms of computing power, I think they that they are not going to require a lot of us. Um, but at this time we don't have to also a lot of we don't have a lot of information either on on how they 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 interact. So these. Connections here are assumptions, which we think are real assumptions, are correct assumptions, but are but are those but are those are, are assumptions. We, we don't have real information so far. Let me start with the experiment. With the experiment, we are assuming that the experiment is going to produce data in series, so it's going to and it's going to be digital. We are assuming that the data that the experiment provides is digital and that is in series. If it is not digital, it could be translated into analog information also. No, no, no big deal in terms of consumption of ports. It will be just changing the <coughs> configuration of the port. It will be a different, uh, a different computing, computing uh, uh, algorithm and a different computing uh, subroutine, obviously. But in terms of, of the of the hardware definition, might might not be a, a big difference. Uh, the, the thing is this: the, from the experiment, as far as we understand, we are going to be just counting events. 
it's, it's that's that's the way I, we we see the experiment, but we might be wrong, and that is something that we need to be to get more more detailed from the experiment um, for our experiment colleagues. Is the if the experiment is gonna just give us counts of the of the event being detected, that's the simplest thing we can interact with, and it's gonna be just pulses. Once we once we receive a pulse from the from the experiment, we just count it. And we just measure the time it was received. We can we can we can give a lot of information about that count, but it's just one count. On the other hand, if the experiment is giving us more, it's giving us, for instance, um, uh, the in intensity levels or frequency levels or any other kind of parameter. Uh, if it is not digital, then we have to know really soon because. If we are going to receive more analog ports, then can, that, complicate, that can complicate things a little bit. Um, I don't think so. Uh, as far as I understand, we're going to use uh, some sort of a digital camera that is going to provide us with the input from the, from the I mean, the camera is going to receive the, the, the measurements of the, of, the, of the spin on the, um, on the photons being measured. And that's why we are, we are uh, assuming that we're going to receive just counting, event counting. That's or anyways, if it is a digital camera, we're going to receive digital information somehow. That's the big question. Uh, the the chose stopper <laughs> for the experiment is that the camera give us information in parallel. If the camera is going to give us like a bus, meaning a whole byte of, of pins, eight pins, because it's going to give us bytes at one byte at a time, or, or one word at a time, that, even, that would be even worse. But if it's going to be in parallel, that's something that we really have to know soon, because that's eight digital ports that we need to count for. That we have some space now, but if we're going to need eight digital ports to receive a parallel connection, uh, uh, in addition to any other type of control that we need to uh, exert on the on the experiment, that that's that's going to be that's going to give us trouble. That might give us a lot of trouble because then we are now running running out a little a little bit of ports. Not not completely, but eight extra ports that might that might give us uh, that, that might put us in a in a in a tough situation in terms of of the size of the microcontroller. Okay. Okay. I don't think, I don't think that's going to be the case, but I want to give that caveat. I want to give that that uh, that notation because it's important. On the side of the communications, I'm I'm ninety nine percent sure that it's going to be serious. Because the communication communications are serious, we are just one link, one frequency that is going to be out. So it's going to be just one uh, line of data that is going to go to the communication subsystem, and that data is going to be transmitted. And it's going to we're going to receive one line of data from the communication subsystem, and that line of data is going to be received. That would be it. I don't think there is anything else there. Uh, the, the additional the additional ports here, for instance, I have two out. It's because one is going to be data, and the other one is going to be, for instance, what is what we call a setup or 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 select. The other one is going to be a, the re in, re in reception. We have data, and we have what normally is called a ready, and that repeats everywhere else. The, the select means that the, the microprocessor tells the subsystem, "Okay, you have to be ready to receive information." So I'm selecting you, so now I can send information to you. So that, that's why we need two pins. One is like, it's like a flag. I'm flagging you to receive information, and certain time after that, I send the information. Now, when the device has information for me, it goes the other way around. It sets up the flag called ready. I am ready to send you microprocessor information and then the microprocessor uh, acknowledge that and receive the data from the from the from subsystem. That normally is the protocol. That's the what's called the handshake between subsystems. All right. 
and that repeats in also here for the for the for the communication subsystem um, with an additional pin here that is the clock because it is very possible that a communication subsystem needs a clock. If the experiment needs a clock, well, we need also to give the clock to the frame. We don't think we need it, but that's something that we need we need to find out. Uh, but in terms of the communication subsystem, we are pretty sure that it's going to need a clock. Uh, so that's that's the only additional pin that we have there. But again, we have like a decent, like eight, nine pins that we, uh, that we have and that are unused right now. But the way we see those is for additional hand shaking that we might need. Because we might need, for instance, not just one pin for control, but two. Because we, we might need, the, the, for instance, the experiment says, we are ready, I'm ready to transmit, but I might need to tell the, the experiment, OK, transmit. And that saying OK, transmit might be another pin, might be another flag. It's like a, like a, like a traffic light. The, 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 the experiment raises its hands and says, OK, I'm ready to transmit. But he won't transmit until I tell him, OK, do it. That process of telling it to do it might require another, another, another pin, which is like normally it's called an acknowledged pin or a, or a um, OK pin or chess pin, whatever. You, it's, it's, a, it's a way to say, OK, you, are, you can transmit, all right? Um, but that's something that we have to discuss. Uh, and this is it. This is it. The, the final diagram, this is a summary. That's what I need. This is a summary of where we are. This summary also includes additional hardware. I, I'm making actually, I, I already have uh, models for, for these maps. These are going to be 74, uh, something. I don't remember. This is going to be 72 something. And these are going to be actually the same like the other one, 74 something. Uh, because I'm an electrical engineer and not, and not a, a, a graphic designer or a, an art major, this is the best I could come up with. So this this um, this trapezoid here on your right is actually three of these ones. Okay, that's why I say three times digital six into one demultiplexer. Okay, I'm gonna move your picture a little bit up. All right, um, and it shows every single pin that we know of at this moment. As I said, there are some that we we don't know, and that, that we don't know that we don't know. That's that's the famous unknown unknown. Uh, but but as it is right now, it's all we have. The good thing is that this is a six. These are three. The, for instance, on the on the here, this one. Oh, I did. Just uh, go back a slide. Just X out of that, and then you can go back a slide in the bottom left corner. Ah, okay, I'm here. Hey, you. you see it, right? Yep, yep. Is it? Yeah, I have a new, a new tablet. And I'm, oh, nice. But I'm learning how to use it. <laughs> it has a button here that I don't know what it is for, and I keep keep on pressing it, and <laughs> weird stuff happens. So, okay, main thing here. This is this is the the. I think for us, is, this is the most important diagram because it gives us a summary of how much hardware we are looking for. So as it is right now, we will need four 16 by one multiplexers. They, they, they can be analog or digital. Uh, that's, the, that's the great thing about those multiplexers. And one eight by one um, digital multiplexer plus uh, three we, we call it converters, which is basically 
the one that was explaining here uh, before, uh, converting uh, just positive analog input to full range positive negative analog output. Um, pretty, pretty sure those converters, so I just wanted to give them a, a fancy name, are going to be just transistors of some sort. So, um, it, but what, what is important here, uh, uh, Jake, for you to, to, to consider, the, the main thing here is, okay, we, we hear all these inputs obviously just become one. That's, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. But for that to happen, we need four control uh, outputs from our, from our microprocessor. Basically, those outputs are going to tell which one of those lines is the one who's going to be transmitted. So basically, if this is, for instance, 0, 0, 0, 0, means that the line number 0, which is this one, is the one that is going to be connected here. All the other lines are just there. They are, they are not transmitting anything. And if I go 0, 0, 1, that's number 3, and that's number 4, so the fourth line is the one who's going to transmit, and so on and so forth. All right? But since I have five uh, my, uh, yeah five boxes in all uh, I cannot define five sets of four ports four. so one for each micro uh, if you max because then I have 24 so I it defeats the purpose of the whole thing so the way to work that is by another pin that those boxes have that is called enable so basically I have five enables and one and, and one yeah five enables and just one single set of four uh, selections and the main thing behind that is that i define by putting up or down the enable which one of those multiplexers i'm working that's the way to we save a lot of a lot of space in terms of force okay okay if the caveat on doing that is that the multiplexers provide, I mean, they, they incorporate additional noise, they incorporate additional delays, um, uh, the software has to be fast enough. If we, are, if we want to, to, to make everybody happy and allow everybody to get in, stuff like that, but that's something that we have to work on the design. But this is the only way to actually do it in an economical and practical uh, way. Otherwise, we will need six microcontrollers at the end and talking to each other. Okay. And that's, that's, where I, that's where I want to stop you. So, uh, so I, I applaud that, that this method is definitely um, admirable. You know, how you guys set this up is, is definitely a very interesting way of kind of working around the fact that you're using one microcontroller. But the key word that you said there is you're going to need multiple microcontrollers. Have you heard of the company Freetronics? No. Okay, Freetronics, you can basically design your own PCB, and you're able to put multiple microcontrollers on a single PCB. Mm -hmm. That might be something that you want to write down and look into because a lot of other CubeSats, when they're, when they're developing them, and you look at their PCBs, they're about the size, you know, they're about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and on the PCB are actually multiple microcontrollers that control different processes. What, what, so, what's the name again? I'm sorry, what's the name again? Freetronics. Freetronics? F R E E T R O N I C S. Freetronics. You can go on there, and as you guys start to kind of uh, go into more detail about your electrical diagram, you can design multiple microcontrollers on a single PCB that takes up an entire 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter space. Mm -hmm. Your processing power increases because you're using multiple microcontrollers that control different things. And that way, you also don't need to have certain people raising their hands, like you said, for each subsystem. You can simply have an entire microcontroller set for that subsystem. And then that way, you guys can reconfigure your software platform so that now you just need to really worry about your power distributor. And so with your power distributor, that was another thing I wanted to mention is that if you go back, you had a giant question mark between your uh, power supply and your flight controller. Um, your, your MSP430, that red line 
shouldn't that be a power distributor to each of your subsystems? Because if you if you take your your power subsystem and your flight controller, and in the middle you put a power distributor, unless it's inside your flight controller, that might be the way that you can divert that power. Um, and yeah, so that way, if, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Is the, the red line actually is not? A, is, I'm not diverting. That that line is, is a monitoring uh, um, input. It is. It's okay. just telling me how much power is being produced. The power doesn't okay. go through us. The the only the only in between stuff that we have are the switches. These switches. Power power doesn't go through our microcontroller. Power goes directly from the power subsystem to each so from power source. To, the, to each subsystem. The only thing that we want to get from the power subsystem is an indicator of, of how much power it's producing. And actually, if the way we, this, we make this, the, the amount of current that goes in is minimal. It's, it, could be, it could be basically zero. It could be just voltage there, no, no current. The, all the current is going to go here, here, and here. No, 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 through the micro. That, that's just to make sure that. Gotcha. Okay. So, how are you controlling how much current is going to each subsystem? Just, is it just by how much it pulls? The, well, at this moment, the way it is, is just on and off. And the amount of current is basically defined by the amount that the subsystem requires. Okay. So, the, gotcha. the subsystem is going to drain as much current as it needs up to the point where the power subsystem can provide it. We are, we are not, we could, we could, instead of having a switch, we could have a dimmer and, and, and have the power subsystem just provi provide, a, 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 and we define how much current, but that's, that's tricky because then we will need to know how much current is needed by the, by the each, each subsystem. And that actually, that doesn't give us much uh, additional additional flexibility because at the end of the day, for instance, the ADCS, the, the biggest part of, of the ADCS will be the reaction wheels. Those are the ones who are going to require the most current. Mm -hmm. And they're going to require, require the amount of current that they need. They, they, so if they need three amps, it's because their motors need three amps. There is no way around that. The only thing is that if a power subsystem cannot provide three amps, well, we have a problem, right? But, but uh, and 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 the, and the wheels are not going to work. So so that's that's part of the design, but not of the operation. At the end of the day, the only thing I could do is say, okay, no more current for you because we need whatever power we have somewhere else. That that's the only thing that we could that we think we should be able to do. Deeming. It's, it's tricky there because then we will need a lot more sensors from each system, and it's hard to tell the subsystem how much current we allow it allowed to eat because at the end of the day the subsystem will need the current that it needs. That's that's that, there is no way around that. Gotcha. Um, you just mentioned reaction wheels. That leads me into my next question. You mentioned that doing that kind of binary method of sending a signal to the reaction wheel, you know, whether it's going to spin one way or spin the other way, as compared to doing a pulse width modulation, um, how would you be able to make minor corrections in, let's say, your, where the satellite is pointing? So, for example, you know, you're going to try to point it at a spot. How are you going to stop a sort of sway from happening if you, you know, send a small signal and it starts to drift back and you send it the other way? If it's just a binary of full or nothing, you know, I feel like there would be some kind of um, yawing in each of the axes to, so that you wouldn't be able to get a really good pointing accuracy for a long duration of time before you start to drift. Not yaw, that's the word I'm looking for, for drifting. So how would you combat that in the binary system as compared to a PWM? Because in a PWM, you basically have, you know, a 0% duty cycle to 100% duty cycle, that being full. And you have every percentage in between that you can you know, vary those modulation um, widths, and that might give you greater stability because you're able to alter the amount of current with time rather than it just be full or zero. Because yeah, in a yeah, way, no, no. That's yeah, I, I think, and, and uh, sorry, I, if I if I if I miss 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 um, miss explain the, the situation. No, you you are correct. We it's, it's two. It's basically two things. One is 
how fast the reaction wheel has to speed. And that's defined with the, the pulse modulation. So the, the more pulses we have, the fastest it spins. So that's the way we control uh, we control the the, that, the the velocity of the of the, 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 the angular momentum basically of the reaction wheel. The other thing is in what direction? Because remember the, the satellite in, in the x axis we you have basically two directions, positive and negative. So I can make the spin wheel go the, the reaction wheel go fast in one direction or slower in the same direction. But I need to be able to do it in the, in the same way in the opposite direction. So that's basically the two things that we need. What I was thinking is, or what we were thinking is that the, with the pulse width modulation, is that half of the pulse is used all, all, this this is the this is the whole the whole period okay mm -hmm. so half of the period is for positive momentum and the other half is for negative momentum all right what it means is that if if i if i'm 50 if i'm at 50 percent duty cycle the spinning wheel doesn't move if I'm 51, it's going to move positively a little bit. If I'm 60, it's going to be a little bit fast. If I'm 95%, it's going to still be in the positive direction, the fastest, right? On the other okay. way, if I'm at 49% duty cycle, it's going, to, it's going to move a little bit on the negative direction. But if I'm going almost to 1% duty cycle, it's going to move the fastest in the negative direction. Okay. The, the only thing that I, I would think maybe maybe this is a question for the ADCS team is that the reaction wheels only work when they're experiencing an acceleration or a deceleration. If they have if they have a continual angular velocity, nothing's going to happen to the satellite. So the reaction wheels actually stay at zero unless there needs to be some form of force applied for the satellite to move. And so the reaction wheel has to, that's the difference between a reaction wheel and a control moment gyro. A control moment gyro continually spins, but the reaction wheels, they will actually not spin at all if there's no correction needed. In the right. So then how would you combat any form of saturation of the reaction wheels being that your, your PWM has to be an inclination or, or, de or, or um, the width has to increase or decrease with time only to one or negative one depending on the direction you're going. How do you, are you, did you find a way that you could kind of regulate that level of acceleration or deceleration? Yeah, yeah, that, that basically, that basically is, is I, this small diagram, this is my microprocessor, is what is called a, um, a, neck, a, a, feedback, a feedback system. The microprocessor is gonna give information to the reaction wheel and the reaction wheels are gonna spin, okay? They're gonna spin. That on itself, it's going to change the momentum of the whole satellite because that spin is going to change the position of the satellite. That is going to measure by the, the magnetometer and the inertial measure, the, the IMUs, the IMU. That is going to produce a feedback to the microcontroller telling, okay, I'm spinning this fast in the X axis. And I need to know if that is a good thing or a bad thing. So at the end of the day, inside the micro the microcontroller, it's gonna be an algorithm okay. that is gonna receive information from the from the from the both the magnetometer and the IMU that is telling me in what direction and at what speed we are rotating. And I know at that moment I know for so, somehow because uh, I receive because I need to point in what particular direction my my mission requires me to point in that particular direction so I need to know where I should be pointing so because I know I know that I have to be in the x y z coordinates then and I know that I'm not not there somehow 
I need to know, okay, I need to spin the wheels this way. And as I start spinning the wheels, and then immediately I receive feedback from the from the accelerometer saying, okay, I'm moving in that direction. So I need to tell the, the wheels, okay, slow down because I'm getting to my position. Or if I'm passing my position, then I use the magnet torques to really dump the 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 the, the, the inertia movement, the, 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 the change on, on momentum. All right? Okay, gotcha. It's, it's okay. Feedback. It's, it's inside. It's inside the microcontroller. It's, the, it's an algorithm that is going to receive information from the from the magnetometer, magnetometer, and the IMU. Is telling that information is telling us in what direction we are, and at what speed we are turning turning in that direction. I compare that information to where I should be. That creates an amount of of a bandwidth that I need to put in my output to the to the reaction wheel so the reaction wheels start to spin. That on itself is gonna create a change of information from here. So it's telling that's gonna tell me okay we are moving in that direction at that speed. So I feed back that information, say okay now slow down, slow down, stop. Because I got I, and I know I stopped because I'm getting that information from the accelerometer and from the and from the magnetometer. Okay, so hopefully I'll probably ask the ADCS question this, but let's let's hope that the reaction wheel assembly uh, that that they're going to be purchasing has its own software for PID tuning. Um, you know, in the event that we're going to be using, uh, like you had said, the, the pulse width modulation, it's going to be kind of interesting. I mean, unless we create our own sort of, um, you know, comparison between the slew rate that we need and the, the level of, you know, pulse width, um, you know, let's hope we have that. But uh, with five minutes left, I just wanted to run over some stuff here. So uh, the CubeSat 101 document on page 58 discusses the electrical report that NASA requires. Um, I just wanted to run through some of the things that I was looking for. It was definitely on that last slide. But you know, obviously, this is our primary interview process. We're going to have a secondary interview process and a tertiary interview process. Um, and then from that point on, uh, we'll definitely be sending, you know, that tertiary interview information to NASA and the proposal. But just in the primary interview process, I just wanted to go over with you some of the things that NASA looks for so mm -hmm. that as you start to refine your model, you can look for these things and make sure that you're checking all your boxes off. So, um, again, this is on CubeSat 101, page 58. Uh, section 6.7, electrical report. Uh, it says electrical report will be used to verify a number of requirements listed in the CubeSat to dispenser or ICD. So the specific information, one, diagram of the electrical power systems. I believe that's gonna be including everything, including the resistors like you were starting to draw. And again, you know, this will definitely be more refined as we go through you know, the development process. So not to, not to be worried right now, but just to kind of throw things on the radar. Um, Highlights for the electrical inhibits within the electrical diagram. The inhibits being a remove before flight pin, which is required, separation switches, and an independent inhibit. Uh, independent inhibit. Uh, page 58 on the right side will have those listed as to what those are, but we have to have those in there. Um, we have to I identify the real-time clock circuitry within the diagram. We have to um, explain the number of inhibits and how they function identify where the separation switches will be as well as where the remove before flight pin will be. Um, I think you, ha you have a really good electrical diagram here that really shows how everything is going to be connected in the ports as well as where it's listed. Um, just as you go on, keep in mind this report because this report is going to be exactly what NASA looks at when they're going through to make sure that we're qualified to actually put it in the dispenser on the ISS to launch it. Um, but I definitely think that's a really good start. And one more thing I'll say is um, definitely look at Freetronics because a lot of CubeSats utilize multiple microcontrollers for their subsystem or for the microcontroller subsystem for their other subsystems. And that might yeah. be able to. Yeah. The one, yeah, that's that was basically at the end one of the the discussions. That, but, but but it comes actually from the other from the other the, the fact that we are doing all of this is because. The 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 ADC the ADCS uh, is providing with standalone parts, standalone elements. So unless they they do their own microprocessing, uh, 
this is basically what we have. I mean, at the end of the day, it's either one like this, something like this for the ADCS, plus something like this without the ADCS for the rest, which could be. That way, we say we say port for both both microcontrollers. Um, we'll just use one microcontroller and put everything in it. Uh, the, 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 and yeah, I understand what you're saying. The, the problem, the problem with using several microcontrollers is that we need to communicate them, and then the the software might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, and but okay, I need really to know <laughs> how the experiment works because that's something that we don't know. I mean, I know I know what we're trying to do. But I need to know how much computing power the experiment needs. Because if the experiment really needs a lot of computing power, so we need to process information, then this, this is not going to work. And as you say, we might need a different set of microcontrollers for each one. OK, gotcha. The experiment um, is not, is not that, that heavy in processing uh, because I mean, what I mean is this: if the if the if the if the mic, if the experiment is producing kilobits of information per second, then this doesn't work at all. If the if the if the experiment produces bits of information per second, we are good. You see what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. Because if 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 for 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 what the for for what the reaction wheels require in terms of processing and what the the I mean tumbling is I mean tumbling a satellite is a hard, is is horribly moving fast and everything but in terms of the speed the microprocessor runs is nothing it's, it's really nothing so right. it really doesn't consume that much processing power unless it needs something else to do. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure that we get that information uh, definitely before the, um, you know, the sip and tip processes here. But uh, uh, just one more question real quick. Um, what services do you see your subsystem requiring for continued development? Any software, hardware? Um, what is it that you're going to need to continue what, what you're doing for the next steps? Anything in particular we're getting? We just got free licensing for AGI's STK Pro software, um, as well as we have a MATLAB and Simulink. Simulink. Um, what is it that you guys are going to need to continue? Well, in terms of, of software, I think we're good in, because we, we, all, we all have a, a, a Compose, Compose Code Studio, CCS, and that, that's going to be our, our, our software platform for the, for the software design. Um, for the hardware design, we will need access to oscilloscopes, uh, signal generators, that kind of stuff. Okay, so basically, one of the rooms in Engineering East that has all that electrical equipment that we exactly. did. Exactly. So, okay. We will okay. That. Awesome. That's that would be the, the 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 main thing. I'm actually already ordering the Maxes. Uh, they're not that expensive. I'm I'm, I'm buying okay. them out, out of my pocket. Um, to to see if I can start doing my 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 my. Breadboard, preliminary uh, assembly. Probably what I'm going to order are not going to be the type of, of boxes that are going to go in the space because they are the plastic ones, the, the thick ones, and they are not that very good for, for extreme conditions. But but that's going to be a matter of packaging, not a matter of, of the design of the, of the mock. So for the mocks, for the designing process, just having one that I can plug in my, in my breadboard is, is, is good enough. Awesome. Okay. Well, Oscar, thank you for doing your presentation. I definitely see that you guys are on track and everything that I saw that there was kind of a hole in or need to be more research, you identified it. So you seem to be on track and, and know where you, your team needs to go and you have a list of things that you're going to need down the road, which we can definitely provide for you. So um, that concludes the uh, interview. Thank you, sir. Don't forget to stop the recording and then send it to me. And if you can't send it to me, let me know. Okay. All right. Good. Awesome. Talking to you, man. Take care. Yeah. You as well. Bye. Bye.